Ladies and gentlemen, it's a great pleasure to be here this morning. I uh, hope you've all returned from having been caffeinated, and that'll be the advantage I'll be able to take um, with regards to the next presentation. Um, hopefully it'll, uh, it'll be uh, somewhat interesting. But before I start, I want to acknowledge the traditional landowners and custodians of the land on which we're meeting today, uh, the Ngunnawal Nation and the Ngunnawal peoples and their elders past and present. OK, I'm very pleased to be here today and I want to acknowledge the, um, the hard work that uh, Air Commodore Evans's team has put in um, bringing this conference together. Um, it's a great testament to the hard work that they've done here um, that we've already had quite an interactive and interesting couple of sessions already and, uh, and I look forward to the discussions that we'll continue to have over the next couple of days. Um, my presentation, I think, is... Um, Timely, it's about my organisation and what it delivers to the department. Um, it's sort of flown below the radar for some time now and I think it's, um, it's timely that, um, that we have a better understanding of what um, the EO enterprise consists of. Um, I think um, first principles review is nearly um, two years old now and, and this was an opportunity, a great opportunity for the department to really bring together um, the EO enterprise and, and really sort out the disparate pieces that had existed up until then. And I know um, as I meet with Air Commodore Evans on a fortnightly basis, we are now inextricably linked and, uh, and working very closely together to ensure that this EO reform piece that uh, General Mulhall mentioned this morning um, is, is making a better um, product and better organisation for the department um, as we move forward. So I'm very pleased to see uh, a combination of international, industry and departmental um, attendees here today. Um, the international piece is important. The industry piece, as we know, is a fundamental input to our capability and also the departmental members here as well, I'm very pleased to see, uh, particularly most of my branch as well. This is an important professional development forum, uh, in particular the Gemini up the back there. I'm very pleased to see you here too. Wish I'd known that before I'd written his report recently. <laughs> so, uh, relatively new explosive materiel branch, and I do want to emphasise the materiel piece. There is an E in there, I'm not a haberdashery, I'm not a clothing store. I tend to get the A in the materiel often. Uh, it's materiel with an E. We were formed on the 30th of March last year. We brought together two branches that were in completely separate divisions in the capability and acquisition and sustainment group. Um, the munitions branch and the guided weapons branches. Those branches no longer exist, although I still see correspondence and emails to that effect. Um, they don't exist anymore. It's all explosive material branch. We're located quite correctly in joint systems division because we provide a joint effect across all the capability managers and we are involved in every single platform that you can imagine that has EO involved in it. Initially, um, after the March um, combination of branches, we retained the traditional SPO structure that we had inherited from the other two branches of munitions SPO, Navy guided weapons SPO, and the RAF Army guided weapons SPO. And I've got to say that, um, you know, as a complete newcomer to the explosive ordnance world, those arbitrary sort of demarcations didn't really make a lot of sense. I never really knew what EO each um, directorate or SPO was responsible for, and it never really made sense. Some had guided weapons, even though they were just dealing with munitions and vice versa. So um, in uh, the latter half of last year, we decided to reform the SPOs, and they are now completely aligned to the capability managers. So you have a one-stop shop in each SPO that deals with maritime, land and aerospace, EO. 
and it's working really well. The capability managers are really engaged with those three SPO directors and their teams, and I'm very pleased that, um, that this has been an opportunity, once again, as a result of first principles review, to align our, our capability delivery. And that just confirms so that there'll be natures that will naturally flow across different capability managers, such as small arms ammunition, which will still be the lead in the land EO SPO, as you would expect. But in the main, um, those capabilities are completely aligned to the, uh, the individual service chiefs. I think as Nigel alluded to earlier, the role of the branch is to acquire and sustain explosive ordnance capabilities for the Australian Defence Force. Shouldn't be any surprises there, but what that actually means is that I am the sole authority responsible for the acquisition, importation, introduction into service, sustainment and disposal of all explosive ordnance for the Australian Defence Force. The sole authority. There shouldn't be anyone else out there buying EO in our department. And if there is, please let me know. <laughs> As well, we are fortunate to be responsible for the management of the Department of Defence's propellant and high explosive factory at Mawaila and the small arms munitions factory at uh, Benalla. And that's operated as a government-owned contractor-operated facility with our close and trusted partners, Talos. And this is the organisation that I lead, reporting to the First Assistant Secretary, Joint Systems. I have a Deputy um, Director General who is also the Program Manager. I have the three SPO Directors on the right, Maritime, Land and Aerospace. Business Services, Business Workforce and Transformation as we still go through a large amount of CASG reform, SPO reform. At the director of the munitions industrial base, which looks after the two factories. And then I also have a professional lead for all the explosive engineers in my branch. This is designed to give you a bit of an idea of the footprint of, um, I have some 400 people in the branch, um, not including the contractors that we have at uh, Benalla and Mulwala and elsewhere. Um, I'll start from left, left to right. So you see Sterling there, we have the torpedo maintenance factory. Mawala and Benalla. Brindabella Business Park um, is where I'm headquartered and I have principally the acquisition elements of the three SPOs headquartered down in Canberra. Uh, the reason for that is that's where most of the committee processes are involved and occur, and that's where the, uh, the acquisition uh, piece really, uh, really gets involved. At the Missile Maintenance Facility at Defence Establishment Orchard Hills, that's where we maintain um, primarily naval and air missiles. We have um, Evolve Sea Sparrow Block 1, SM2, and all variants of Harpoon that we maintain there. As well, we have an outsourced model for ASRAM with our partners, our MBDA as well, at uh, Orchard Hills. At Waterhen, we have the Mine Warfare, Mine Warfare Maintenance Facility, which we just successfully outsourced and that transitioned to Kinetic on Friday last week. And I was just up there last week to, uh, to uh, do the walk around. Um, that does primarily uh, the non-explosive elements of mine warfare, um, and that's uh, the Stonefish Exercise Mine and the Danish um, Mine Disposal um, Kit, DAMDIC, the terrible acronym. Um, set on the shores of uh, northern Sydney Harbour there, it's very pleasant. Uh, we also have out at Denalum House in Penrith, the, um, primarily the munitions SPO people and a number of other people um, from uh, across the branch, mainly a sustainment uh, element of the organisation and there are many people here today from that, that, that element of the branch as well. And then up at Amberley, at uh, RAF Base Amberley, we have 
another element of the missile maintenance facility, which quite obviously primarily does missile maintenance for Air Force uh, aircraft. I also have two liaison officers overseas, one in Picatinny at, uh, at uh, New Jersey, and, uh, and he is the liaison officer to PEO Ammo in the US Army. And then we have a liaison officer embedded in the NATO Sea Sparrow Project Office, which is primarily involved with Evolve Sea Sparrow Missile Block 1 and Block 2 as we, uh, as we move forward with that project. I think it's important to reflect on some of the things that we've achieved in the last couple of years. Uh, we have continued to provide direct support to the Air Task Group on Okra, which is in the Middle East. Um, that's been an amazing achievement um, and, and something that I think CASG isn't necessarily associated with sometimes. It's that direct support to operations and, uh, and they've done a fantastic job throughout that, that deployment and continue to do so. Uh, Mark Blood wouldn't let me go <laughs> without talking about the award-winning project JP3027, which this year won the Essington Lewis Trophy for the uh, Small to Medium Enterprise Team of the Year for 2017 and major acquisition over $50 million. That was an innovative technology, JDAM ER, and, uh, and it was a fantastic uh, opportunity to recognise their great efforts, both with Ferrer and also Boeing and our own project team in Department of Defence as well. Another really huge achievement, I've got to say, um, I mean, the department has spent a considerable amount of money on this facility, uh, the Mulwala Redevelopment um, Project, JP2086. Uh, when I arrived in uh, what was then Munitions Branch some two years ago, that was uh, the Poison Chalice, I guess, um, the, the ugly stepchild that I, uh, I was told I was going to inherit. And I've got to say that um, if it wasn't for Talus and the hard-working team there that, uh, that brought that project to fruition, we wouldn't be uh, celebrating initial operating capability very shortly with CDF and the Secretary visiting very soon. So that to Kevin Wall, Dion Habner, uh, Warwick Spencer, all your team there, you know, very grateful for what, what you've achieved there. We now have the world's most modern uh, propellant factory in the world and, and it's, it's doing fantastic things uh, beyond our expectations in capacity and, uh, and quality and, and we're very, very pleased with that project. It now signals, I think, um, you know, an op a real opportunity here for us to maximise the use of these facilities, both Mulwala and Benalla. And, uh, and we're now working very closely with our new capability sponsors in Director General Explosive Ordnance to look at how we can maximise the use of that facility. Um, and we are working with, closely with a number of industry partners as well as TALUS to make sure that we do use that facility and re return some of the investment that we have made into that facility. So very pleased about that and more importantly, um, looking forward to celebrating uh, the initial operating capability of that facility very shortly. Torpedo Maintenance Facility has had a, um, a big achievement here in bringing the Mark 54 torpedo into service as we phase out the Mark 46 torpedo, our lightweight torpedo, and move to the Mark 54 for an air launch capability. We'll still be operating the MU-90 as well as another lightweight torpedo for the surface ships, but that's been a, um, a, a big undertaking by our Maritime EO SPO in introducing that into service and getting the facility certified to operate and maintain. As I mentioned before, Kinetic Australia now working in HMAS Waterhen doing our mine warfare maintenance and very pleased with the achievement of that. That's been one of the, the key um, directives of First Principles Review, which was to outsource any of the sustainment activities that we felt um, could be done by industry, our industry partners, and that's certainly the first of what I see will be many in CASG, and, and it's going to be a, a great example of, uh, of what we can achieve in, in conjunction with our industry partners. 
plan non-guided weapons. We recently signed a contract for the major munitions contract, and uh, and I don't want to say too much because it's subject to um, a media release that will be out shortly. But uh, very pleased with what we're doing with that space there, where we're consolidating our contracts and uh, and coming up with a, a more robust arrangement for the delivery of explosive ordnance to our defence force. So very pleased to have solved. Uh, so signed that, I should say, uh, recently, and look forward to working closely with that industry partner as we uh, as we move forward. And whilst it was probably over a year ago now, I think um, we did sign a new standing offer deed for EO freight forwarding and shipping as well, which was awarded to Redcliffe International. That's our primary partner now for the importation, shipping shipping the EO from our um, main main sources in Europe and uh, the US to Australia, and, uh, and that's working remarkably well. I think we've got our second, or had our second delivery this year. Um, what I haven't mentioned there, and, uh, and it's still subject to, uh, uh, I guess, guess, government approval and, uh, and media attention will be Land 17, 1 Charlie 2, the future artillery ammunition piece as well. And, uh, and we're looking forward to a, an imminent government announcement on that one. And, uh, and I think that'll be an exciting space for us to, to deliver an alternative supply of ammunition in the 155 millimetre artillery ammunition family. So, um, and that's been a long time, um, a lot of hard work by our land EO team in particular. So just reflecting, I think, as I put this presentation together on what we have really achieved, is um, we now have, I think, um, you know, a one-stop shop, I hate saying that word, but it, it is truly the case, located in one branch. You know, you have one branch head um, in me, responsible within the CASG organisation. I think that aligns us far better with the capability managers and the capability sponsor of, um, of DGEO and CJLOG. So I think that's, that's given some alignment and some surety and clarity of who's responsible for what in the department. And really, um, as I arrived into this space some two years ago, having different capability managers, not, shoring who, not sure who was really truly responsible for my whale of Benalla, it was quite an unusual situation, I've got to say, for a, 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 you know, particularly when you look at JP2086, where we've spent some $1.8 billion on this facility, not to have a capability manager there telling us what we should or shouldn't be doing and giving us some priorities. So I'm, I'm really pleased and, and energised by the, the, um, the efforts that we have from Commander Joint Logistics, and I have no doubt that Air Commodore Evans will talk more about the EO reform program and, and, and the, the elements of what he sees the EO enterprise will be doing moving forward. Uh, it's great to have that leadership, it's great to have that direction and, uh, and it's great just to have somebody else to sort of you know, lean against and to talk to when, uh, when we are dealing with this EO enterprise. And, uh, and I think that that's, only can be better for the department moving forward. And that completes my presentation. Are there any questions? Commodore Evans said you would be a very polite lot, so I don't expect. Oh, here we go, Matt. Uh, Matt um, I was wondering if you have any thoughts on uh, how the branch might be affected by first principle reviews going forward in the next couple of years, or any initiatives that uh, that you may be considering. I, I think um, the first principles review has had a large impact already, as I've pointed out there in in a couple of the slides. Um, moving forward, there's a number of decision briefs that we have. Well, we've had Brooke and Bechtel review all the SPOs, and they've come up with a number of recommendations, which I'm not privy to disclose just yet. Um, they're still subject to the departmental approvals, um, and we will move forward very shortly, probably in the new year, with those recommendations subject to them being approved and agreed to. Um, I think if you read the first principles review, though, and, and I'm sure you have, because um, it's close bedtime reading for all of us, I, I think it's, it's something that we still are firmly trying to stay true to. Um, there's, there's still ongoing reviews. It hasn't disappeared. We had the defence 
senior leadership group retreat last Friday. It's still in the forefront of the defence leadership's minds, including the ministers, and they're, they're very much um, wanting to see us deliver on those recommendations in the review and continue to deliver. So, you know, if, if you read some of the, um, the recommendations in that review, you can probably assume that, safely assume that we will continue to deliver, such as, uh, as I said before, outsourcing some of the uh, functions where we see it's sensible to do so, where there's a value for money element associated with it as well. And you're already seeing some of that in, in the branch with the outsourcing, the mine warfare maintenance facility that we've just done. Okay, I'll take my leave. Thank you.